But you know, when the Lord begins to talk about us or when he tries to help us to understand him, I remember reading an article and, and the article said, what is the name of God? And they tried to give the different names. But in reality, God does not need a name because he is God. And when you stand before him, you're not going to address him by his name. You're going to fall completely prostrate at his feet and worship him. For he is your creator. Come on, amen. So God does not need a name. But the reason why he gives us names is so that we can understand his very nature. When you say Jehovah Rapha, all right, the Lord who heals us, that is his very being, his very nature to heal. No sickness can dwell in the presence of this God. It's just his very nature being there itself. In fact, the centurion servant said, you don't have to come to my home, just speak the word. And you and my servant will be healed. His very presence brings about healing. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. He is, that, that's his nature. John sums it all up when he says, God is love. God is not loving, he is love. His very being is love. Everything that emanates from him is love. There's not one iota of, of uh, bitterness or hate or, or, or prejudice against anyone. That's why he made us all different, red, yellow, black, and white. There is no prejudice with God. God is love, amen? And so in order to help us understand ourselves, one of the major uh, definitions he gives of us. He doesn't call us bears. My people are like bears. They are, they are ferocious. They, they are very protective over their young. He, do, he doesn't say we are like lions and, uh, you know, uh, like the king of the beasts. He, 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 he doesn't even say we are like foxes, They're wise and, and subtle in their ways. He says when he talks to us, he calls us sheep. So this morning I'd like to talk about a psalm from a sheep. We call it the shepherd's psalm, but this is actually the psalm of the sheep. And you all know which psalm that is. However, you know, just like the Lord's Prayer. How many of you know the Lord's Prayer? You don't know. I feel so. We call it the Lord's Prayer, but actually it's the disciples' prayer. When you pray, say, Our Father who art in heaven. So when it comes to this uh, uh, psalm of the, sh uh, of the sheep, we know we're talking about Psalm 91. But you know, I, I want us to have a, pic a look at this ram first. I want us to have a look at this, ra this ram. Can we have a picture of the ram? The ram, not the psalm. Just, just the, the, no, 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 not the congregation. Not this the sheep. <laughs> There's a picture of a ram. Do you have a picture of a ram? You just showed? Okay, where, where is it? Go back again. Let me see the ram. I can't see it up there, so I don't know. All right. This is a merino ram. It's one of the best. I mean, it's number one among the sheep. It's beautiful. It's thick. It's nice. Very well looked after. But here is a little video I want to show you about what this ram can become. All right, let's start from the beginning of the video if we can. And no, no. I wanted to show you before. But it's okay. Watch this now. It, it was a ram <laughs> that was lost. It went on its own way, decided it was beautiful as a ram. It didn't fit in with the rest of the lambs, the rest of the sheep. So he decided it was just going to go on its own way. And finally, it got lost. And as a result of which, you know, nobody knew where it was. And then they found it about a year or so later, more than a year or so later. And what they found was a ram that had more than 75 or uh, nearly 70 uh, kilograms of extra wool on it. And uh, it was stuck because it could not move. It was too fat. It could not move. 
And have you ever heard this term, don't pull the wool over my eyes? The wool literally was over its eyes and it could not see. And if it was not found, it would have died. Because everything on it had grown to be so big and it couldn't handle itself. So the ram, when it is part of the pen, they call it the sheep pen, it is protected and it is sheared on a regular basis so that, you know, it still has its nice later on, it'll grow back again, all the, the wool will grow back again, and it will always look well. Unfortunately, you know, this is the thing with many people. Very often they leave the sheep pen and they feel not necessarily leaving church, but I'm talking about just leaving what God intends for them to be. And they feel that they can be a self-made ram. I can do things on my own. And eventually, that's why God warned his people. He says, when you become fat, do not forget me. Because I have a way of trimming or sharing you so that you will once again look good. Come on, amen. God knows how to protect his people. So this morning, I want us to look at how David, who has been a shepherd boy from the time he was a little boy, all the way, you know, up, even as a, as a king, he always had a shepherd's heart. He put himself in the shoes, quote unquote, of, the, of a lamb. And now he begins to recite this psalm. He is about 16 years old. He's out there in the wilderness looking after his sheep. And, and his heart is always reaching out to God and he's beginning to think, this is how I should relate to God and this is how my God relates to me. Let's go into the psalm together, shall we? Psalm 23. Everybody can see that on the board? Want to read it with me? Let's go together. Let's go. The Lord... All right, all right. Don't read it the way that you have memorized it. Read it the way that it should be read. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Come on. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare in the presence of my enemies. You, my cup runs over. Surely and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Everybody say, Amen. 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 So, this sheep, as David places himself in the position of this lamb and he's speaking out, uh, he begins to share with us what he, he experiences with God and what his own sheep experience with him. He's basically sharing how the shepherd loves the sheep and how this is demonstrated. So first of all, this love is demonstrated by his relationship to his sheep. It is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Come on, amen. There is this personal thing that we have. This, this, this is now my shepherd. Now notice how he, he begins to brag about this Lord that he has. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me. Besides still waters. He's bragging about this Lord that he has. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. I wonder how many of us can actually brag about the Lord in the same manner. Sometimes we talk about so many things but the Lord. Wouldn't it be a great testimony to brag about the Lord? That God is the one who has done this. You know, sometimes my wife and I, we, we are just at home and, or we are driving uh, after all the kids have gone back and we are just alone at home. And we go, 
He has blessed us. What a blessing it is to have all these things and more. God has blessed me. Have you ever bragged about the Lord? I think it's about time we begin to know Him as our personal shepherd. See, when He is my shepherd, there I shall not lack in any area of my life. It is only when I begin to have something else that I depend upon as my provider, as my shepherd, as my protector. Talk about that in a moment. When we begin to talk about that, then we've got nothing to brag when it comes to the Lord. But when we talk about what He has done, because He is my shepherd, I do not lack anything. Think about it for a while. What is it you lack if the Lord is your shepherd? You talk about material wise, we've got more than enough. When we talk about the love or peace or whatever, He has already provided all these things through Jesus Christ. What is it we lack? If we are still lacking, then I need to, if I'm still lacking, I need to ask myself, is He really my shepherd? Because if He is, then I should not lack in any area. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. The peace that He gives will pass all understanding. I will always have more than enough. I will be a lender and not a borrower. If He is my shepherd, come on. And then he is, he's not just satisfied with this one. He talks about his personal relationship. Then he begins to change the conversations from, I'm bragging about him. I, I've already bragged about him. Now, Lord, I just want you to know that you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. You are the one that anoints my head with oil. So there is a, there's this wonderful relationship that he is enjoying, which is an invitation to all of us. He can be everything to us and then it's a reciprocal kind of a thing. We begin to say, God, because you're all this, you are the one that anoints me. You are the one that prepares a table even in the presence of my enemies. I can have a table of abundance, Lord. Come on, amen. You are the one. You are the one. I mean, this, this is such a wonderful picture of the lamb and the Lord. It's like David puts himself in the place of this lamb and he's talking to, to all the other sheep. I want you to know who he is. He is the one that does this. He is the one that restores our soul. He is the one that leads us in paths of right. He, oh, then he turns around, he looks upward and he says, God, you are the one. You are the one. There is this personal relationship. So the shepherd's Love is demonstrated, first of all, by his relationship to his sheep. Also, by his responsibility to his sheep. He describes how the Lord ministers to his sheep. He promises them his provision. He lets me lie down in green pastures. Leads me beside the quiet waters. One of the things about the shepherd in those days was they con constantly move from place to place to place to place. So when Joseph went looking for his brothers, they were not in one location where he could find them. They were always taking the sheep and going from one location to another because the shepherd tries to find the best place for his sheep. The true shepherd. Jesus talks about those who are hirelings who have been hired by the master to look after sheep, they are different. They just, you know, whatever the sheep can take, they take. But the shepherd wants his very own to have the very best. Come on, amen. He leads us. He, he makes sure that I am in the right place and he makes sure that the waters are not threatening. They are not like waterfalls. They are nice, cool streams where I can safely put my head down and not be afraid of falling over. See, the sheep are very funny. Once they fall over, they cannot lift up themselves. Their legs are too short. Not like goats. Goats fall down, they can get up. They can jump on top of things and run. But sheep, lamb are different. Their legs are very short and they fall. And most of the time, their wool, 
which is very nice. We like to look at sheep. Many of us hardly look at goats, except that when it's cut and eaten. <laughs> but sheep is different. So he has to make sure that they go to places where they don't fall over and drown. And he, and he see, the thing about God is there is not one iota of, of uh, harm to any, inside his heart to harm us. Come on, amen. He wants to make sure we have the very best. So, the, the, another thing about it is he promises them not, now he promises them his paths. He leads me in the paths, right paths for his name's sake. And he does this his way. He does it for his name's sake, not for the sheep's sake. We hardly pray this anymore. But years ago when people pray, they will always pray, Lord, we ask all these things for his sake and in his name. Nowadays, we don't pray for his sake. Now we pray for in his name. And most of the time, it's to help everybody understand prayer is over. We use it like a little formula, but God is different. It is for his sake. So we have Jeremiah 29, 11. What does it say? Everybody? For I know what I have planned for you, says the Lord. I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you. I have plans, a future filled with hope. Three times, I have the plans, I have the plans, I have the plans. And three times, he does not say, and I will let you know what those plans are. So he leads me in the right paths, the paths that I should take, not the paths that I would like to take. So whether it is through a valley, or whether it is on top of, mountains and nice places, he's leading us. There was a time where the Bible says that the Lord deliberately took Israel out of Egypt and took them by the long way. Forty years of where they could have got there in three weeks. He took them 40 years, but it was his way. It was his plan. And when they tried to break the plans, they were defeated by the enemy terribly. And so they had to go back into the plans that God has. May we be quick to learn from our mistakes. Mistakes are things that will happen. Every one of us will make mistakes. Can I hear the amen? We all will make mistakes. It's all right. But the Lord wants to lead us back into the place where we, we follow what the, the plans that he has for us. And folks, they are good plans. Plans, when we follow them, will make us prosper. Plans that we know at the end of the day, there is a good hope for us. Everything that God has planned is good. It's just that we don't know what it is. And thank God he has blinded me to my tomorrows. I don't know what tomorrow brings, but I do know who holds my tomorrow. The reason we preach like this is so that you can have faith in your God, in your shepherd. Can I hear an amen? He promises them his presence. I will go with you. One of the wonderful things about the Lord is he's always ahead of us. Verses 2 and verse 3, even in the darkest of times, in verse 4, God is always involved in, uh, with our lives, even without us seeing it. Very often, we don't see God at all. God does not make himself manifest in many things that he is doing. But God works in mysterious ways. His wonders still to perform. He does. God is in the background of everything that goes on in the life of a person who loves God and called according to his purpose. And he is a good God. Come on, amen. See, all these things need to sink into our spirits. It's not just an intellectual thing. Listen to me very carefully. Information does not bring transformation. There are a lot of things that we know, but we don't do. Right? Come on. 
All right, here's one. Don't get angry. Husbands, love your wives. <laughs> Even as Christ loved the church. Do we know that? Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. I have to balance it. Uh, that was not fair. Do we know that? Humble yourself. I mean, there are a lot of forgive one another. All, all this stuff that we know about. We know for information does not bring transformation. It is only the embracing. And I talk about this in our Bible study. It is so important for us to understand this. You shall know, become intimate, embrace the truth, and the truth shall set you free. It is not just a receiving of the information. It is the embracing of the whole thing that causes us to become free. And I pray that you will embrace the truth of the word of God. Amen. All right, let me go quickly now. He promises his protection. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, they had something like this. This is my inheritance from my father. But it was not like this. It was much longer, a very long one, like from down right up to this, like this. And the hook was a bit bigger. This was the staff. They would carry that with them and they would place it down at the side. And then they would watch the sheep. If the sheep goes off a little bit further and they are in a dangerous position, then they would go to as far as they can and then pull the sheep back. That's the staff. So it protects the sheep. But then on the other hand, they had a staff. I wish I had brought the other one. That one was thicker, just one whole thing. Uh, one of my members in Kwantan got it from me in the jungle, Rotan. You know, he used to go into the jungle, do surveys. So he got one hard one. He said, this one, Buster, you can whack anything, the bones will break. So he thought I needed it as a pastor. <laughs> but this is still Rotan. So he would have one that is about as short as this. This is to fight off animals. And if you have seen some of the, the things that the shepherds used to carry, it's a hard at the end of it, there's a very big knob kind of thing. So it was like a weapon that they would use to fight enemies off. Okay? So David went up to the lion and the bear. Possibly he would have used that one and fought that thing before he tore it. He didn't just jump, catch the lion, caught it by its mouth and open like you see in movies. <laughs> he would have hit the thing down before he attacked it. So the rod and the staff, they comfort me. But there was something else that they also had. And that was a sling. Now the sling uh, was not so much to hit the enemy. Every uh, number of sheep that they had, they would have a small percentage of goats to mingle with the sheep. Very often they would have a small percentage of goats inside. And the goats would actually decide the boundaries because goats do not know how to stay within the pen. But they would go certain places. So... The, the shepherd would allow the sheep to follow the goats up to a certain place. And then when the goats would begin to climb up on top of rocks, if you've been to Israel, you know a lot, a lot of rocky places. When they climbed up on rocks, then the shepherd would use the sling and hit the rock. Loud sound, pop, and the goats would quickly jump back down. So all these things. So when the, when the sheep saw the rod and the staff, they felt very comforted. No matter what happens, I know he's going to protect me. Amen? Huh? So when we see these things, we know that these weapons that God has is not against us. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper because the weapons that I have will always overpower the weapons of the enemy. Come on, amen? We are assured of his protection. Now, if he does allow us to go through different things, remember that he is good and he's still involved in the paths that he is leading us. Can I hear an amen? For all things will work out for good at the end of the day. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, now, the final thing is by his restoration. How does he demonstrate his love? By his restoration of the sheep. He restores my soul he anoints my head with oil. He restores my soul, the area of my emotions, the place that gets me so easily riled up, the things that causes me to become so hurt, sleepless nights, anxiety. Sometimes we get offended. You know what the Bible says about offense? Listen to this. 
Proverbs 18 and verse 19. It is harder to win back the friendship of an offended brother than to capture a fortified city. His anger shuts you out like iron bars. So Hebrews chapter 4, 15 says he can be touched by our feelings. So sometimes when we get offended, we set up bars against people. The root of bitterness defiles many, the Bible says. It's a very difficult thing to do. So he restores my soul. When David sinned against God, he felt so down, he could not sleep. He says, I have sleepless nights, my heart is painful, all these things. Then when Nathan the prophet came to him, told him what you have done is wrong, David repented. One of the first things he said is this, Lord, restore the joy of my salvation. Because I need to know, once again, what it is to feel joyful on the inside. I'm so hurt, I'm so, what, whatever I've done is wrong, but some of us, not because of uh, sin, but because of what people have done to us. Words have been spoken, different things have happened, very, uh, listen to me carefully now, this is so true. The only ones that can hurt you are people whom you love. Outsiders cannot hurt you. The ones that are closest to you will often hurt you by something they say or things that they do. Sometimes it, it, adver uh, advertently, I mean, it's not deliberately done. It just happens. And then they feel, you know, Why are you welcome? and they don't even know. They don't have a clue. So somebody said, you know, feeling hatred towards somebody is like taking poison and hope they die. Huh? When we have this feeling towards other people. It's like us taking poison. They don't have a clue. And we are hoping something happened to them. No, no, no. Something's happening to you. And I need the restoration of my soul. Come on, amen. I need my soul to be restored. I need joy. I need happiness, peace to come in again. I need to be able to laugh again. Sometimes because of what happens with your relationship with somebody on the outside, you know, in your working place, whatever it is, you bring it back home and then your whole house is affected by the atmosphere I create. I want my home to be a happy home. How about you? I want there to be laughter and song and joy. I, you know, I like that kind of an atmosphere and I pray that all of us would have that desire to create, but it begins with me on the inside of this house. God restores our soul, amen? He anoints my head, which is the place where all this kind of stuff comes in. And we think about it, and we record it, and we play back again, and we go back and back and back again, and play it again and again and again, all up here. Proper visual and everything. I need him to anoint that because that can break the yoke over my mind. Amen. It breaks the yoke over my thinking. The pattern that binds me, that says, I cannot do this or I cannot do that. I'm not capable enough. I'm not good enough. I've been, you know, all these things have been spoken over your life. It has to be broken. That's why the Lord, the first day I got before him in his presence as a druggie. If you can save me, please save me. Save me or I'm gone. I'm finished. My life is gone. And I thank God he walked into the room and anointed me with the Holy Spirit and broke the yoke. Completely broken over my life. And if he can do it for me, he can also do it for you. So now, how is it that David as a young man, 16 year old, speak, could speak like a lamb and have such confidence? The very first line tells us the story. The Lord is my shepherd. Not my father, Jesse. Huh? Not the king, Saul. Not the politician, not the boss out there. But the Lord is my shepherd. No matter where I am, it is not this person or that person or this circumstance. My circumstances are not my, it's not my shepherd. My situation is not my shepherd. I don't function according to all these things. I function because the Lord is my shepherd. Amen. Very interesting to note that David wrote this song 
when he was about 16, and then he gets the call to go into the room where Samuel anoints him to be king. Then he's almost immediately sent on a trip to go give his brothers food, and he meets Goliath. Can you imagine if he had not had this experience before he met Goliath? Thank God he knew him as a young man. Whether we are young or whether we can old, we can discover this relationship with him as well. Amen. First Peter chapter 5, verse 4, Jesus is described as the great shepherd. Many of us know John chapter 10 and verse 10. The thief comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. But I am come that you might have abundant life. But we don't know verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. He's a, he's a good shepherd. I thank God he is my shepherd. If I had listened and, and put my trust in others, I would have been gone a long time ago. But he is a good shepherd. Good shepherd. Hallelujah. Amen. If you don't know him as a good shepherd, or as your personal shepherd, I pray this morning, if you're watching online, you would let him, you would invite him and say, Lord, please be my shepherd. I want to say all these things. I want to honestly brag about you. I want to have this rage and say, truly, Lord, you Restore my soul. You anoint my head. I want to say these things, Lord. Be my shepherd. Would you stand with me as the ushers come and as the musicians come, sorry, and we serve you communion. This is what it's all about.